welcome to Inside Healthcare. We're coming to you from inside the urgency room in Egan, and we're here to talk with Dr. Rob Anderson. So thank right. you for being with us. Okay. We're going to talk about having a healthy spring break. A lot of kids and families mm -hmm. are going on spring break in the next few weeks, mm -hmm. or currently right now. Yeah. So um, I know we still have the flu mm -hmm. still around, and there's always these concerns about the coronavirus. So mm -hmm. what advice would you give to families, that, especially if they're going to be traveling? Sure. You know, a lot of people are wearing masks these days, so you can wear a mask if you'd like, but just the common normal practices of washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, using hand sanitizer is very important, and then also not touching your eyes, nose, or mouth, and that's oftentimes where the illness will be spread. If, it's, if you touch a door handle that has some bug on it and you touch your eyes, nose, or mouth, that's typically how we catch it. Um, or it could also be uh, something just in the air through droplet. If somebody sneezes next to you on the airplane or next to you um, on the bus, it's possible to pick up some of that illness from them as well. So just using general precautions is what we always recommend. And um, if they want to get more information, because this is changing day by day, week it by is. week, so they should be checking in with um, yep. our health officials? Yeah, so I would just go to the Minnesota Department of Health. They have a great website, so does the CDC, and they have up-to-date information about the COVID-19 or the coronavirus and what to do for it. Uh, even at the end of February, they're only recommending restricted travel to China, but then it's been expanded to other countries as well at the beginning of March here. Um, so it's constantly changing on a daily basis, and the CDC and the Minnesota Department of Health do a wonderful job of constantly updating that information for all so of us. So not only traveling, but also if they have symptoms or something, they should mm -hmm. also contact the health department. Yeah, you know, a great option is to call the triage line on the back of your insurance oh, card idea. and talk to the triage nurse. And oftentimes they'll have different algorithms that they can go through to determine who is at risk. Because quite truthfully, there's a lot of fear about coronavirus right now, and there is concern about that. But the great majority of people have not had travel, have not had any contacts that they know of with coronavirus or COVID-19. And probably people have just a normal upper respiratory, lower respiratory infection, or influenza. Mm -hmm. And that is thing, those are things that we can manage and take care of here at the urgency room. All right. So talking about traveling during mm -hmm. spring break, let's talk about some of the more common things that sure. they might encounter, like especially if they're going to warmer clients, climates, and mm -hmm. there's the, the sun is more intense and yeah. things like that. What yeah. are some of the things that they should be concerned about? Well, all of us in Minnesota, as soon as we get to <laughs> a warmer climate, we're, we're just so excited. We love to be outside in the warm weather, be out in the sun. And so we're coming from Minnesota where we're indoors all the time and the sun is at a different angle up here. And we get down to a warm area and all of a sudden we just want to be outside all day and we forget to wear the sunscreen. And it's just such a common thing that we think about in the summer while we're in Minnesota. And make sure you remember the sunscreen when you travel if you're going to a warmer area. Well, and I would say too, I did a lot of my spring breaks mm -hmm. in the mountains, skiing yeah. and stuff like that. Same thing, same advice That's I right. would think yeah, would apply. Being up at a higher elevation yeah. is very important Seems as like, well. Yep. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So and what would be some of the other things um, that you might see or give it, um, advice to families to protect mm -hmm. themselves when they're traveling to these sure. other places, eating things, drinking things that they not normally yeah. do? Then. That's a great point, Jody. A lot of people are going to be eating out at a, a restaurant a lot of the times or going out and eating foods that they're not used to eating. And oftentimes those foods are higher in salt. So just making sure oh, to increase your, that. your water uh, in your diet um, and just watch what you're eating. You know, oftentimes we're excited to try all these different new foods, but it's a diet that we're not used to oftentimes. So I just say use caution and moderation. Um, make sure you're still having, you know, lots of fruits and vegetables and drinking plenty of water. Yeah, really for that mm -hmm. to prevent dehydration. It's Correct. Just yeah. Concerns. yeah, especially if you're going to be in the sun all day in the warmer climate, you know, or if you're going to be skiing all day, you know, in a, mm -hmm. a higher elevation your demand for flu goes up quite a bit more. And I hear from a lot of friends and family, they tend to do a little bit more drinking when they're on vacation than Certainly. they uh, alcoholic beverages when yep. they're not you know, at home yeah. and stuff. So that yeah. could also be a concern. Yeah, certainly yeah. if you're going to be drinking alcoholic beverages, you know, plus you're going to be out in the sun. I mean, all that will make you more and more dehydrated. So it's very important to stay hydrated. What about if you get some kind of a skin irritation or mm -hmm. a rash or something like that? You know, here at the urgency room at all three of our locations in Egan, Woodbury, and Vadness, we often see people come in with a rash, and sometimes it is after traveling. And one thing that's very unique is people will go stay in a hotel, and the hotel uses a different type of laundry detergent or dryer sheet on their sheets, and they come in here, and people have this head-to-toe rash, and they don't know what it is. And wow. oftentimes it could be a contact dermatitis just from exposure to new sheets or something else that they're not used to, or perhaps a new food as well if they went out to a restaurant and had shellfish for the first time and had not had that. Um, so certainly just a generalized rash, um, we, we're able to evaluate that. 
But certainly if somebody's having difficulty breathing or difficulty swallowing, signs of a serious allergic reaction, you know, always call 911 if you have a high concern. Otherwise, those are certainly conditions that we see here on a regular basis Which as well. Could, could be a variety of things, mm -hmm. yeah, yep. that could be causing it. Any other tips or advice for people that are going to be heading out here sure. in the next couple of days, next couple of weeks? Sure. Yeah. I'll just say enjoy your time. Remember, you're going on vacation typically. You're spending time with family and friends. So enjoy that relationship development and that low-key time away from work and away from the home and all that and just really enjoy your time and drink plenty of water, monitor your diet, wear your sunscreen if you're outside. Well, great advice yeah. as always. Thanks, yeah. Doctor. Well, thank you for and coming. And we'll be back with more right after this. Son, love is like the ocean. You have to tread the oh, waters. Oh, Dad, that's not the kind of help I needed. Jessica, will you go to prom with me? Yes. Thousands of teens in foster care can't wait to share their first with you. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. Minnesota is known as one of the healthiest states in, in, in America, yet the Minnesota Department of Health reports that not all people in Minnesota have the same chance to be healthy. To talk about health disparities in Minnesota, we're very pleased to have with us Dr. Mark Steffen. He is the Vice President and General Chief Medical Officer with Blue Cross Blue Shield. And also joining us is Rosemont Sarbong Owens, Director of Health Equity, Integration, Diversity and Inclusion at Blue Cross Blue Shield. So thank you both for being with us. Thank you. And not only some don't have it, we have some of the worst or the worst health disparities in the country. Yeah. What are we talking about? It's, it's surprising because we're blessed with such great quality uh, health care in the state. Yeah. Um, but we're seeing these rapid demographic changes all over the country, and that includes uh, Minnesota. Um, and I think you know that's certainly something that uh, we're seeing contribute to the health disparities uh, that exist, and you know really give us an opportunity to drive uh, improvements so that we can have everyone realize the benefits of the great quality health care that we have. Well, when we're talking disparities, what are some of those areas and factors that we're talking about, Rosemont? Yeah, so areas such as infant mortality is one area so you just don't hear about you know no. people are surprised by that yeah so african american and native american women mm -hmm. die twice at the rate of white women in minnesota in minnesota in minnesota and then also another example of of, of a health disparity is so for um a three mile radius within um, St. Paul, there is a, th a 13 year um, life span gap between people who live in like Frog the Frogtown neighborhood or and uh, more affluent neighborhoods. A shorter lifespan just in that radius area? Yeah, and That's we're talking, insane. we're talking just that's not even miles yeah. apart. That is insane. Um, so it is really shocking. Mm -hmm. and so, so have you heard of this adage, show me your zip code and I'll show you how long you live? Yeah, no, I haven't. Yeah. So maybe realtors can start using that because it's actually true. And there's a lot of research to back that up. Yeah, and we see these social determinants of health. So within and those zip those codes, yeah. we usually see these social determinants of health having pretty heavy emphasis on our health outcomes. And if you look overall, 40% um, you know, of health outcomes are really driven by these social determinants of health, which are like what... access to healthy food, um, uh, good uh, public education, um, socioeconomic status is, is heavily determined by the zip code that we live in, uh, and those can have a big influence on your health. And when you compare that to how much our health is influenced by the traditional healthcare system, really only 20% of our health outcomes are ultimately determined by the care that we get within the four walls of a hospital or clinic. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a factor that we really need to figure out uh, both as a state and as a country, how we address that. And how do you go about starting to address that? Now, I know this is a passion of yours. That so, so I'm going to put the passion hat off. Okay, okay. <laughs> and then, so, um, how, so if you look at example of Blue Cross, so even before I heard of Blue Cross, the health plan, 
I had seen commercials on TV many years ago about exercising well. So there was a very funny um, 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 individual with some funny d d dances, right? And then asking oh, us funny. all to d do simply, right? So, so to your question about how do you start to address um, th th that, this is something that Blue Cross has done for many, 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 many years, taking into consideration the fact that health doesn't happen only in a doctor's office. Blue Cross has been committed many years to building healthier communities. So working with, with communities to improve the places where we live, play, and work, right? So, so, so the Center for, for Prevention and the Blue Cross Foundation has been doing work in communities for many years. And in the last five years or so, we've decided to turn inside to take an introspective look at what we're also, also doing inside of, of the walls of Blue Cross to impact and improve health equity. And some of that focus was, did it start with the tobacco case? That's what's coming. Yeah, so the, yeah. if you look at the development of the Center for Prevention, uh, that was developed out of the proceeds from the tobacco settlement. Mm -hmm. uh, and really the goal of the Center for Prevention has been to allow people to live healthier lives. Um, and they certainly had a focus in the past on um, helping people quit smoking, and uh, they continue to have that focus. And that's through, been very successful. It has. We the really drove and driven down the rate of combustible tobacco use. Although, you know, we are yes. in this epidemic of vaping, and you know, working to really understand what's driving that and and how we can. Uh, help impact uh, that. So th that continues to be a focus uh, of the Center for Prevention. That work will never be done until we can absolutely end the use of combustible uh, cigarettes as well as other commercial mm -hmm. tobacco products that work will and has to continue. Uh, but they also work on other upstream factors uh, that impact people's health. So healthy exercise, mm -hmm. um, healthy eating, and they layer on a pretty heavy health equity lens focusing on those populations that are the most disadvantaged because, frankly, that's where we have the most opportunity to impact. Yeah, like fast foods are the cheapest foods, but they're not maybe the healthiest foods. Yeah. yeah. Well, and there's people in some of these zip codes that mm -hmm. don't have access to a place to buy the healthy foods. They, it, it may only be a convenience store that they have access to that has a very limited offering um, and, and those are the types of things that you see within a zip code uh, that can really influence and impact people's health. So what would be some of those other things that you're doing to help make a change in these areas and to reduce that health disparities? Um, so some of, some of what we are doing is access to healthy, you know, healthy f f f foods um, and also um, working in communities. So, um, for example, in the community of Wilma, um, Blue Cross has invested heavily the past five years in what is dubbed as the Healthy Wilma in Initiative. So we have community tables where everybody in, in, in Wilma is invited to actually come together to talk about innovative approaches to drive a healthy Wilma. And what is very exciting about that is these co community um, t tables are made up of individuals who historically haven't been a part of the process. And that would so be who would be that would be part new of them. immigrants, populations oh. of color, you know. So, so there's some of the inno innovative approaches that B B B Blue Cross is coming alongside communities to actually help them come up with their own um, solutions to community problems. So with an equity, so the, 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 the health equity lens that we are bringing to the table is ensuring that their voices are the tape, that there's equ equitable um, voices at the table. And as we mentioned before, we started filming that equity and equal are not the same thing. Right? We're talking different things here. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, and I think that's it's it's conceptually extremely important to differentiate between the two. And you know, it goes back to how we've looked at the golden rule. Um, you know, treat others as you would want to be treated. Well, you really need to take that a step back and treat others how they want to be treated Good and point. find yeah. out how, have that intellectual curiosity to stop and ask. And that's why I think the, the, the importance of this Wilmer Community Table with the purposeful inclusion yeah. brings out new ideas that probably never would have been generated um, and can really help improve the health of the community. So example, right? If Dr. Stephen got up this morning and said, hey, I'm going to visit Jody and, and her team and I'm bringing, um, I'm bringing um, shoes for everybody. So he goes ahead and brings size 10 shoes for everybody here, right? So if you are somebody who wears a size 10, guess what? It's your lucky day. But what about if you wear size eight and a half? Yeah. So what, so he, it was an equal just, gesture from Dr. Stephen. It, was an, it wasn't an equitable gesture. Now, if we, he were to Good have point. called in advance and said, hey, I'm thinking of doling out shoes to all of you. Can you please give me your sizes? So Dr. Stephen would have come this morning armed with an equitable gesture because all the shoes he will present to you will fit you, no matter what your size, because you get you got the opportunity to let him know in advance what your size was. And as I, I was saying too, that this is a passion of yours to have to create this equity among everyone in Minnesota. That is correct. Yeah. And why is that? I think um, so. So that is very interesting. But I think I got the opportunity firsthand growing up in Ghana. I realized that. I was quite a curious kid, so I went to school and other kids didn't go to school. And I was somebody who always asked questions. So asking, so why, you know? But I didn't really get satisfying answers. So when I grew up, I could see the effect of those who didn't go to school, because anytime I was in boarding school, I would come home, I would see them, right? So now I go back, back, back home and I see my colleagues and friends who didn't get a chance to go to school. And Jody, to be very, they never get their, their dreams realized. And I think, so it, it came from inside of me. I got an opportunity when I came to the United States to work in a, in, a, in, in a hospital, and my job was as a birth recorder. But I think that was where I didn't need rocket science. So recording about 20,000 birth certificates and recording all that information about the mother because that is how the state gets maternal child health data. Okay, it's supplied yeah. by hospitals. So you fill out all of those. And I said, mm, I need to do something. I always went to my boss and said, well, guess what I saw? I saw, and he said, well, Rosie, you can't just complain all the time. You need to be a part of that solution. So having two kids, I said, working full time, I said to go back to graduate school so that I will be an informed, passionate advocate who can be a part of this of this solution and not just talk about the problems? Well, thank you for people like you. So I'm no, I'm, and I'm also grateful for uh, companies like Blue Cross, who's given me the opportunity to mix my passion with the work, right, to support the organization's efforts in eliminating health inequities. So I count myself blessed. So our viewers, what advice or tips or how can they get involved? How can they help make a difference and help? Reduce these disparities? Yeah, I, I think um, when we talked about inclusion and as we think about, so what Roseman's really brought to Blue Cross is to bring health equity to the forefront of the conversation. When we're thinking through policies that we're going to implement, um, being thoughtful about the impacts that that can have on health equity um, uh, and make that systematic so that it's built into the system that's being created. Uh, and, and so I think people can think uh, that way. Um, I always like to you know, promote intellectual curiosity. So I, when you're talking with others, really come from a position of wanting to understand um, and listening to understand. Uh, and, and, I and that's think, the start. Yeah, that's really the start and it can help you frame uh, in your mind what might be impactful. And I, Roseman, I'm sure you have a thousand ideas on how people can get involved. Yeah, so to the broader community, and so Jody, I've told you about one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King. He, so he talks about us or 
being like a, 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 a garment of mutuality, right? And I'm paraphrasing. He said, what affects one directly affects us all indirectly. The Center for Prevention did a study that found that we as a state, we lose, so the cost of health equity, health disparities to the state is about 2.26 billion, right? And guess what? It's not the cost only to those who are affected yeah, by it's all, it's all of us. Yeah. So in that, I'll say that be, be curious about your communities. When you have an, a, a, opportunities that food, food pantries, learn about your com, com, community. Give, be a voice and be an advocate to your community, you know, with, 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 with housing, right? Healthy food, shelter, right? There's so many opportunities for all of us to help our state curb and ultimately eliminate um, health disparity. So be woke, right? Mm -hmm. Know what is around you and be woke and stay woke. Well, it's been a pleasure to have both of you with us today. Thank you for a great information for our viewers. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Stefan and Rosie. Thank, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure, Jody. Thanks. And we'll be back with more right after this. Let me tell you about the toughest guy on earth. He does the work of two jobs, but only gets paid for one. Caregiving is tougher than tough. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. We're back with Inside Healthcare. March 1st through March 7th is National Sleep Awareness Week. And with us moving our clocks ahead during the 2020 Daylight Saving Time this month, what better time to talk about the importance of sleep and for our health and our well being? And we're very pleased to have Dr. Roxanne Richard Pritchard. Mm -hmm. With a science, scientific director for the Center for College Sleep and Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of St. Thomas. So thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks and, for having me. You know, sleep seems so natural, but it's not. I mean, it's not as exactly <laughs> as natural in today's modern society with all of our Wi-Fi and our phones and our electric light. It's becoming a little bit more of a challenge to make sleep natural. And why do we need sleep? And what? Um, oh, sleep is. <laughs> and how much is, do we need? <laughs> sleep is everything for the body. It is probably the it's most as important as water. And, and yes, yes, yes. You die without sleep. You die without food, water, air. That's incredible. Yeah. So sleep is the most important behavior you can do in a single behavior for your health, right? And Americans kind of pride themselves, oh, I didn't get a lot of sleep. It's right, like, and why, that's not doing do us do any that? good, right? Yeah. <laughs> so adults need between seven and nine hours of sleep. You know you're getting enough sleep when you wake up naturally. You don't need an alarm clock, and you feel pretty refreshed throughout the day. You don't need to guzzle coffee, and you're, you're doing pretty well. So um, what are the health benefits of sleep? Sleep. And what happens when we sleep too, I guess? I know it's a long, in-depth thing, but maybe just <laughs> What happens when we sleep yeah. and what are the health benefits? Yeah. All right, so sleep is a chance for the brain to do processes that are incompatible with wake, right? So some of the stuff the brain needs to do every day in about a two to one ratio is stuff that cannot happen while we're waking. So some of those things are clearing out cellular and me metabolic waste from our brain, including what builds up and, and leads to Alzheimer's disease. Um, some of that is restoring our immune system, our emotional balance. So sleep is a chance for our body and our brains to really do a lot of basic healthcare maintenance and building of memories. And with us moving the clocks forward this month, what does that do to us? Oh, our it's hard. And if you're catching this before spring forward, you can start um, getting ready for spring forward by going to bed a little bit earlier each day of this week. Oh, okay. Yeah, but what happens is um, you losing that hour of sleep is actually pretty harmful for a lot of people. There's more heart attacks that Monday morning than any other day of oh, the year, crazy. right? Yeah. Um, we're more rushed, we're stressed, we have our cortisol spiking earlier, our hormones are a little out of whack. Um, so it's important to think about kind of preparing for that change earlier, getting your kids to bed earlier. Yeah, as a former news reporter, I mean, I, I was aware of there was more accidents, more mm -hmm. heart attacks after the change yep. in the time there. But it's always nice in the fall then when you get to the, yep. an extra <laughs> hour. So you do extensive research with um, college students, and what does your research say about sleep and 
our research shows that sleep is one of the biggest predictors of mental health in college students. No. Right? So one wow. of the consequences of being sleep deprived is depression, anxiety, um, attention deficit disorder. So what we can see is that your mood is better balanced when you're getting good sleep. But that's not a message that most students have, have ever gotten, no. not from their schools, not from their communities, because a lot of the schools start way too early for high school students. And we're starting to see some of the school districts change that and start just a little bit later, but even right. then it's probably not Right. The state of enough. California actually just passed legislation that high schools won't start before 8.30. Oh, So that would great. be something like, I think, um, when only one out of five Minnesota high schools follows the CDC recommendations regarding school start time. So when you work with the students, I mean, what are, are they just like blown away by it? They're... Or? They're so hungry for or, sleep. They're so exhausted. Like deep in their bodies, they know it would do more, but they just don't see how to make that possible. So what can you do to, can you make up your sleep? Or you can make up a little really bit of the sleep. The best um, thing is to kind of prioritize it in your life. Keep the same routine. And when you have the same routine, that helps with sort of combating feelings of insomnia. If you have a sleep disturbance, which many of us do and don't realize that we might have a sleep disorder, get help. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine Foundation has a great website that's just sleep education.org where you can get information about restless legs and sleep apnea and jet lag and, and children's sleep and all these other kind yeah, of I, I mentioned how my to get daughter's good sleep. a new mom and <laughs> she's having a hard time trying to get that sleep. Yeah. yeah, you lose 42 days of sleep the first year you're a parent. It's hard. 42? Yeah, it's a lot of sleep oh loss. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. Yeah. So what would be some helpful tips for our viewers on how they can improve their sleep, get more sleep, get the sleep that they okay. need? So your sleep environment should be like a cave, dark and cold, so like 60, 65 degrees, uh, quiet or maybe with a sound machine that kind of blocks out extra noise, having the same routine, looking to see if the medications um, you're taking might interfere with your sleep, limiting alcohol before sleep. Uh, and that would be a good start and getting help if you need it. I think I read also too like um, not eating what more than two hours before you go to less yeah. than two hours before yeah. you, you don't go want to be sleep. hungry or full your when body's you're trying, to, trying sleep. to digest that food and right. you're trying to go to sleep right and really limiting screen time before bed so kind of screens that's off that's got to be key that is key especially so for what young happens kids. with that screen with our sleep so three things happen one there's light from the screen that mimics the blue light of the sky that tells our brain it's it's still daytime so we, um, blue light filters can do a little bit, blue light blocking glasses can do a little bit. Second thing is that it's uh, time displacement. Like we mean to go to bed at nine, but whoops, three episodes have gone by, right? <laughs> <laughs> that happens. I've been known to do that, yeah. And the third is that we just get our, like worked up. So either we see a scary news story, we read it as something that's due for work. It's something that sort of gets our brain into, uh-oh, got to think in prepare mode rather than relax mode. It seems to be a problem for me on Sunday nights. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, but it seems like, yeah, I can't shut that mind, so I just have to get out of bed and just read a little bit, something to quiet my mind right. that works for me. So other advice, we have just a few more seconds here in the show. So Other advice for sleep? Yeah. Um, Definitely talk to your healthcare provider if you have concerns that if you're sleeping eight hours but still feeling tired, you might have a disorder like sleep apnea. Um, that is very easily treatable and life-changing when you do treat it. And it's very common. Very, it? very common. And you probably wouldn't know. You probably yep. So if like your bed partner, spouse, or, this yeah. is a gross sound, but if your bed partner is like. <laughs> That's a sign of sleep apnea during sleep. Oh, good point. So that's what you want to listen for. Well, any um, books or research or anything that people should, if oh, they want more information? Oh, there's a lot of great books out there. Or um, more information about sleep? There's so many books, I don't want to recommend one over the other. Uh, <laughs> that, but the Sleep Foundation website, sleepeducation.org, is a great place to go. Well, Dr. Pritchard, it's been great to have you on Absolutely. the program. Great right. advice, and hopefully we all get a good night's sleep after Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Yep, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. That's our show. We hope you can join us next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then, everyone.